This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. When I put a season together as artistic director, I tried to get a balance, and that includes not only popular works, but works that are less well known. And this particular work has always appealed to me. It's been a long, long time uh, since I first heard it, and I knew that it was an opera I wanted to stage. And what you need, of course, for this is a great bass, and with Fruccio Ferlinetto, it just fell into place. So the artistic director part of me said, that's the season. The great thing about Eliot's play is that he has clearly done research in putting it together in the first place because many of the references in the text, even some of the things Beckett says, are extant. There is uh, written documentation of what Beckett said in many circumstances. Eliot picked that up and in putting the opera libretto together, the librettist who was Pizzetti kept it so that um, it is very close to the Eliot. The Eliot is close to history and therefore I feel very comfortable with it as a kind of a history. It's not moment by moment, but the ingredients are what actually happened. It's a wonderful opera where themes are concerned because it has not only the political debates going on about the power between the king and the archbishop, but there's soul searching on the part of the archbishop himself. Beckett is approached by four tempters. They're not real people, they're in his head. He's debating with himself as to what he could do. He could overpower the king. He could become chancellor again. He could become friends with the king but one of the tempters says, become a martyr. And Beckett's response is, how dare you tell me what I've been thinking about myself? And this is evidence that he's arguing in his own mind. difficult somehow to show what is happening in a human mind and in this piece you have this possibility in the first act when he is dealing with his own his own thoughts the temptations are nothing but his own thoughts and uh, it's a very challenging situation for a for a singing actor let's say therefore this is by far the reason why I am so attracted by by Thomas Beckett so the theme of martyrdom, the theme of loyalty to the church, 
the questions of loyalty to the king, they're all explored in tangential ways now and then, but anybody following the story uh, closely will know exactly what's going on. And Ralph brought me, first of all, some designs for the set that were very abstract and very appealing, I must say, but they were hard for an audience, I think, to read. And with a story that is so steeped in history, I felt it was better not to abstract it this time around for this audience, but to put it clearly in a cathedral. I read the play again. I read Ian's super titles, it was sort of his version of the play. And then I, I actually read some books about the event itself, the murder of Beckett, um, and then did a lot of research about the cathedral, which culminated with me actually going there. The detail is authentic. The arrangement all of, of all of the authentic parts is a theatrical representation. It's not exactly what the cathedral looks like, but if you've ever been to that cathedral, uh, this one certainly is, is evocative of it. And some of the specific things, like the, uh, the research for the stained glass windows and for the Beckett window, uh, that stuff is right out of the, uh, of the, of the cathedral. Eventually, you have to end up in the cathedral, and whatever you do has to look like a cathedral. So that was how we ended up uh, with a, a, a much more um, symmetric set. See the joint of the platforms out there? It's on stage at the Grey Yeah. That's the off stage edge of the cross, and he hangs like this as far downstage as possible. When we first started working with Ralph, he had a, a series of lifts and traps and sort of some fancy little pieces that came out of the floor. And we've since just artistically moved away from those pieces. Now it's, it's really uh, uh, much more traditional. It's stuff that we do all the time, big giant columns, big stages where we have large choruses. But I think it's, uh, I think it's a great space and I, th I think it's really gonna work well for the show. So we've left openings with things on, on the back. Like right now, sometimes we have front scene, back scene. Mm -hmm. Danica with the costumes did decide without any difficulty in trying to be relatively authentic. We include actually one of the uh, garments that Beckett would have worn himself because it's modeled on one of his uh, garments that actually is still in France. There was never a question about stylizing this, or it was always about staying true to, um, to the historical facts, religious garments, vestments. All of the garments that we'll have in the opera are either ba based on these existing garments that we've replicated uh, or on my research from, from that time. We thought that it was going to be interesting if we actually see the knights, even though it's not in the music. They, during that time, they're not singing. They go to a tavern where they actually drink and get ready, put their armor, weapons, and then they come back to the cathedral. So we're actually going to see that moment. And then we had this idea that at the same time that we're seeing this, we could actually see Beckett getting ready for Vespers. Uh, and putting his vestments uh, for, ve uh, for Vespers uh, that night. And it just made the moment, um, uh, just brought a little bit more of, a, of drama, I suppose. There were a lot of very specific garments with very specific names that get put on in a very specific order. Some members of our audience may know the correct way that that happens in real life and we want to be as true to that as possible. So I came up with this document that I call My First Priestly Garments. It's a clothing guide and it has things like this is a tonsure, it's the bald spot hairstyle. This is the zucchetto, it looks like a little skull cap and that's what the priests wear to cover the tonsure. As much as possible, I included pictures of Beckett's real items. They're on display from the Cathedral of Sen, so I tried to use pictures of his actual clothing as examples. And it's not just his clothing, it's also veils and wimples, any sort of vocabulary that we had to come across and be familiar with in rehearsal. What, what is he wearing in this? So right this, now, is our, this is our expert. So okay. you've taken off everything except that basic <laughs> under tunic. The first thing in rehearsal, 
I was really the point person on how his clothes were ordered, how the changes on stage were working. So I had to be very clear on which garments went over which other garments. And we were really lucky that we were given the muslin mock-ups, sort of the practice dry run pieces of the costumes to use in rehearsal so that they would be as much as possible exactly like his real show items. While I've been living with these for several weeks now, the dressers and the wardrobe crew don't necessarily know what things like a pallium or a chasuble are. They know that it's the poncho thing or the collar thing or the skull cap thing, but all of the plots, which are the documents which tell the dressers how to dress the people, they all use the technical terms. And so I've given my clothing guide to our wardrobe staff so that they can use the same language and that we're all on the same page there. Whatever else you're giving them to do, whether it's uh, wearing a particular yes, kind of exactly. costume or, or climbing a particular staircase or whatever else it might be, you, you have to make sure that they really can um, sing while they're doing it mm -hmm. and what they can do and can't do. And it's not a, um, it's not a matter of the, you know, someone not being capable or being inferior because they can't. It's really a matter of, of uh, respecting what it is they're really trying to do out there and, and, and trying to support them while they do it. There is a moment at the end of the first act when Beckett is talking about 30 years ago when he was a young priest and um, the pleasures of just being alive and following your faith and it's incredibly beautiful and you see a side of Beckett that makes it clearer to the rest of us why he is so adored and why these women and the people of Canterbury will do anything in our power to say, go away, don't be here because you're putting yourself in danger. In every very special role, there is something that, first of all, you, interpreter, sing just for yourself. And this, trent'anni fa, going into the end, I am doing it for myself, first of all. Then eventually there is an audience that will be somehow even luckier to receive something that is extremely felt. But this is by far what I enjoy doing it. There is really a self-enjoyment, amazing. <laughs> and the finale, of course, the dramaticity of the finale is impressive, it's vocally very demanding because it's, a, it's very much based on a register, vocal register, that uh, it's more bass baritone than, than bass, therefore all your concentration must be in there, but all the, all the events are so chained one to the other that the ending comes in a, in, in a moment, in a flame. It's just a flame. And uh, it's a magnificent piece. I mean, I will never be bored to, to do it or to propose it and to try to put it together wherever it comes because it's one of those that can make your happiness.
The herald is the one who comes in to tell the other uh, priest that Beckett is going to be coming. And he has a few things to say, not, not just to say that he's coming, but there's a foreboding. So I'm setting it up. I'm the one that sets it up. I was saying recently about this role, I actually get more nervous for smaller roles like this than I do for leading roles. You don't have much of a chance. You have a few minutes to show what you have. And so you're sitting there going, okay, I better get this right. <laughs> I can't make a mistake. <laughs> I love theater. And uh, Ferruccio and I talk a lot about it because we really believe that's almost more, almost more important than the singing. And what I said to him, the, we were standing, sitting backstage getting ready to go on. I said, you know, honestly, because you act so well and because I know I think the same way, your singing becomes better because you stop thinking about your technique. At this point, you already have a good technique or you're not gonna be doing it any. He and I have had very lucky to have very long careers. understand why are we here what is our purpose do you know you go off into your positions as the priests come through and we take it from there okay women of Canterbury who make up most of the chorus work are very, very important. They comment on the action. In fact, one of their first statements is, we can do nothing, we are condemned to watch. So I took the decision to have them watching. So the chorus will always be on stage, that is the women, and they're around the walls of the church, they're around the pillars, they watch what's happening but they can't change it. In this regard, they're rather like a Greek chorus because the Greek chorus knows that it can't interfere with, with the world. But they're also a little different because they are actually addressed by Beckett himself and by the priests. So they're, they're this mix of Greek chorus and real participants. But the music they sing is out of this world. <laughs> One hand as closely as you can. I want him totally surrounded by pleading hands. Okay. Directing them is uh, perhaps easier in some ways than uh, a production like Falstaff, where you try to make them individual characters. Okay. Neil, people in front, Neil, come in as close as you can, all of you. And he's like this. And put energy into reaching out. Not, not just this, it's, it's got to come sort of from the hips up. And he's like that. All right, stay there, let me see how we look. <laughs> In general here, they are the women of Canterbury in a generic kind of way. There's no way to bring out much individuality, except for the two characters we call the first and second choristers. These are leading roles, a mezzo-soprano and a soprano. They do have personalities, and we see them reacting to what's going on, trying to comfort the rest of the choristers in their desperation. <laughs> This is the 
first opera I've done in a multi-year career where I'm the spokesman for the chorus. Usually, I don't pay a lot of attention to what they're saying, but this time, I have to listen to what they're saying and add my two cents worth. Um, it, is, it is the leading lady. Um, she's the soprano. I'm the only character in the opera to have an aria where I get a chance to digress from a little bit from the Beckett happenings and I get to talk about the good things in life, gardens and springtime and the seasons and it's actually a beautiful aria. The score is an undertaking but I am so enthralled with this music. Supertitles are very important to me in any production. And when I'm directing, uh, I always do the titles myself and I try to do them for many other productions that, that we stage here. I believe very strongly that the librettist worked very hard to compose his words and that my job in doing the translation is to try to repeat what he had written so far as possible, not to truncate it. Because the libretto has been tied to the music, the emphases are on certain words. And it means sitting down with the score, listening to the music, timing how long a slide might stay up, working with dictionaries, looking sometimes for similes that uh, might replace a longer word. I love doing it. Uh, it truly is a great discipline. And if I'm directing, by doing the translation myself, I discover things I didn't know. There you go. The score itself will be marked with uh, entries and exits for each title. And we'll also have what we call yellows, which is a piece of kind of fluorescent yellow sticky paper with the translation on it. So as I'm reading the score, I'm reading in this case Italian, and what I will see on that yellow is the translation that will appear on the surtitle screen. And then my job is of course to have that down with the vocal approach of the uh, principal artists because they will take various liberties which is expected is certainly in a drama such as that we're doing now and I want to come in on a title as close as possible to when they begin the title but not before and not dead on something a little after and I want to get out before they stop singing but we would like it to be up as long as possible so that people have a chance to look up whenever they might look up <laughs> What I'm practicing when I'm in rehearsal with this hand, you'll see that gut, you know, that move, and that's a go. That's when I want the surtitles operator upstairs to bring in the slide and take the slide out. So normally I will say go to him and also use the hand gesture. Go. Go. I'm calling cues just as the stage manager would call lighting cues, etc. Uh, we just have more of them. In uh, murder, for example, they're close to 700 cues. Go. Go. Subtitles in film are similar to what we do here. 
However, in uh, a movie, for example, the dialogue goes by much faster than the dialogue that we do here or the sung portion of the score that we do here. And so it's always truncated. They're never translating everything. And we try to translate everything that uh, is being sung. We're there for a reference. If, if something gets past you or, or you need something, then by all means look up. But uh, don't devote your entire uh, opera experience to looking at the surtitle screen. I really hope people start to appreciate this opera. It needs to be appreciated. It's fantastic. And when you have someone like Ferruccio Furlanetto, who is playing Beckett, and it's a one-man show, and we're all his minions, but he inspires the rest of us to be better actors and better singers and more involved with what we're doing. And I am in, enthralled. He's wonderful. Of course, there is a kind of, not rejection, but the audience is a bit scared. They, they consider this an, a modern opera. Okay, it was written in 1953, but it's everything but a modern opera. In this opera, there is music, not noise. And this is a very important thing. I mean, you would, would you have the same attitude towards Britain? I don't think so. And should, it shouldn't happen with, with Pizzetti as well. This could be an opera that's done a lot. I think it's just not been done here. Uh, why, I don't know, but it should be.